Welcome everyone, a big international neurosemantics welcome to each and every one of you. Uh, a special welcome to our fine founder and leader, Dr. Michael Hall, and First Lady Geraldine, although I do not see her on screen, I hope she's woken up. Um, <laughs> my, is she there? I, I don't I'm see here. her anyway. Are you there? Welcome, our first lady. Um, <laughs> my name is Hobati Mahome. For those who do not know me, I chair the Southern African Institute of Neurosemantics. And in that capacity, I serve on the global leadership team of the ISNS. This is a neurosemantics wisdom session. It is about deepening our knowledge and experience so that we can continue to be at the top of our game and make an impact uh, in our world. We have this session every second month. Important to note that we have this Neurosemantics Wisdom session every second month. It alternates with another online session that focuses a lot more on community engagement, sharing experiences and learnings across all the many institutes across the world. Now I know from earlier conversation that some of us are attending this session for the first time, while some of us are regulars. So whether you are a regular or a first timer, we together have a beautiful 90 minutes to deepen our knowledge and experience, 70 of which will be dedicated to learning from our founder, Michael Hall. These neurosemantics wisdom sessions are more like for me, those days that many of us in this room can relate to, where we sit with our elders, them telling us stories and us learning from them, getting the secrets, wisdoms of, of, mm -hmm. wisdoms of life from them. So before we get into it, uh, before we get into our learning and take off our shoes, let us get our international voices into the room. So what I'm gonna do right now, very shortly, is to share the slides from every um, institute. And when I share the slide, when it is your institute, the invitation is you greet us, you give us a very warm, unique hello from your country. Okay, mm -hmm. so we're starting with the Institute of Neurosemantics in Middle East and North Africa. So please unmute your mic and say hello to us in a unique way. Hello, Hi. everyone. Hello, everybody. Hello. Everybody. Hello. Yes. Mar yes. Marhaba, yes. Lebanon. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> Welcome. Yep. Hi. Then next, who is the Southern African Institute? Say hello to everyone, guys. Hello there. Hello. 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 Good morning. Good morning. Hi. There we go. Then the next one is the Philippines. Where are the Filipinos? Greet us uniquely, guys. Mabuhay. Mabuhay. Oh. Hello, Mabuhay. Hey, hey. Welcome, welcome. Good to have you. Uh, Indonesia is next. Brazil. Thank you. Thank you. How about Australia? Can we hear from down under? Good evening. good evening. Sandra and Sean is here. Good evening. Hello, everyone. Oh, good <laughs> evening. Thank you. Thank you, Australia. Ha, Europe. I think it's Hi, Jermaine. Everyone. And, oh, okay. Jermaine, we need to get you rent a crowd, eh? So that you can yeah, get people to come, come in. They will come. <laughs> they told me they would come. So I hope I will tell them you're too late, guys. <laughs> All right. Okay. Then we go to Malaysia. Say hello, hey, Malaysians. Welcome, everyone. Good to hello, see you. Hello. 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 Thank you. Thank you, Malaysia and Latin America. Hello. Ooh. 
Hola. 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 Michael. <laughs> Come on, Geraldine. Okay, all right. <laughs> and who is this? Oh, did I skip somebody? Scandinav no. Scandinavia. 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 Where are the Scandinavians? Nils. Hello. 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 Oh, there you go, Jacob. And then, whoa, 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 Hong Kong and China. Hello. Welcome, welcome Hello. everyone. And, and from Hong Kong. Last, I think Hong Kong is the last. Yeah. So let yes, me Hong Kong. Sharing, I think, I think is the last. So thank you so much, guys, for all of that. So, so that welcome and bringing your voices into the room. Mm -hmm. So yeah. is there anybody left out? All right, so we said today is about deepening our, our learning and deepening our knowledge. So just before we get started, let's just get to what are some of the ground, the guidelines, I don't want to call them ground rules. Some of the guidelines that will ensure that today we get the best experience. So firstly, Michael loves questions. He's really, really great at answering them, I can tell you that. Um, so all the questions, please put them in the chat. Start each question with the word question or abbreviation Q, semicolon, then write the question, make them succinct to the point and as clear as you can. So Wyman, my colleagues Wyman and Karen will collect those and uh, send them to David, who is our moderator for today. The second thing is please keep your videos on. We really do want to uh, connect with you, see you, um, but the only requirement is please put your mic, I mean, mute your mic um, if, uh, so that we don't interfere with the, uh, the learning that we're gonna get today. And also, if you're gonna be doing a lot of movement, it's okay to put your video off unless up until we ask to take a video. All right, so with that said, let me hand over to our moderator, David Murphy. David is the president of the ISMS and a senior member of our community. Thank you, David, for your wisdom and leadership. I hand over to you as uh, you moderate this session as we learn from our founder and leader. Over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Kawati. And thank you very much to all the community. It's always a pleasure for me to be part of this, uh, this movement, this <laughs> community. Uh, I feel really proud to be part of this and to keep learning from Michael. Michael, hello. Good morning. Uh, good evening. <laughs> good morning. <laughs> I think it's, it's a good time to start. Uh, and I was thinking perhaps the first, the first part could be like having an overview of, of the topic and then we can move on and get deeper. What do you think about that? Sounds good. Okay. So the subject is learning, and learning is a function of thinking. And in 2016, when I finished the uh, series on meta-coaching, uh, 16 books on meta-coaching, I, I started looking at thinking from an NLP perspective, what is thinking? And that led to executive thinking, that led to metaphorical thinking, humorous thinking, thinking as a modeler. Uh, exec, um, executive decisions. So it's led to a lot of other facets of thinking. And if thinking is the most fundamental human resource we have, which it is, because it's by thinking, everything occurs. Then learning, which is a facet of thinking, you can think and not learn. A lot of people do. But learning becomes our most essential resource. And out of that comes wisdom, which is the ultimate resource. So we're looking at the, the thinking 
that learning does and what learning is. And in just a moment, I'll review what we did last time with what learning is, and then introduce the uh, seven dimensions of learning, which is a new model. It's a model by which you can learn anything in a more thorough, um, uh, solid and, and uh, accelerated way. We have some echo, echo, echo. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. Well, that that's really interesting because you, you just said that we have uh, like three basic or fundamental resources. The first one is thinking. Without thinking, I think we, we wouldn't be human. The next one is learning. Learning is like uh, everything we do is by learning. And then from that becomes wisdom. So um, tell us a little bit more about this model, the, the seven dimensions of learning. Uh, what is it, firstly? So in NLP, one of the things we do is model subjective experience. And there's nothing more subjective than learning. Um, it's not an <laughs> external thing. It manifests itself externally, but it's an internal experience. So the question now becomes, how do we model this thing that we call learning? We, we send our children to school to learn for 12 years, maybe, maybe graduate work later. And so we spend a lot of our time learning. How much do we learn? How skillful are we at learning? When we learn something, what about maintaining that learning so I keep the learning with me so I can use it as an ongoing resource. So learning is a subjective experience and it, it is uh, quite complex. So we've divided it into seven dimensions and it's here on the board. So stay in the picture if you will. You need, you need a pretty face in the picture. <laughs> We need a pretty face there. <laughs> At least one. <laughs> That's so good. these are the seven dimensions, and we'll go into them in detail in a few minutes. Learning, obviously, is a state, and um, it is how we represent and hold things in our mind, how we then take information, this is just information, and we turn it into knowledge. So knowledge is at a meta level to information. And from there, that information and knowledge, we, when, we, when we remember it, it becomes background knowledge, which means that as adults, we never start from the ground level. We never start fresh and open. We always have background information affecting us. When we step out of the whole thing and we go meta, this is the place where we can change our learning programs because we're learning about how we learn. And as you learn how you learn, you, you now have choice. Um, if you got a bad learning habit, an inadequate one, a slow one, uh, one that is distorted and contaminated with biases and distortions, you can update it. Learning, is experiential in that it's not just information and just knowledge, but it becomes neurology. And as it becomes neurology, that makes it a mind-body state and learning is pragmatic in what you do. Because if you can't do what you have information about and knowledge about, if you can't do it, then have you actually learned it? So those are the seven dimensions. And these seven dimensions, we'll go into each in some detail in a moment, but each of them define learning. So a full definition of learning is that it's a mind-body state that orients you to the subject that you're studying. If you're in the right state to study NLP, that'll be an NLP state. If you're in the right state to study music and learn music, that'll be a, that'll be a self-organizing orientational state and that learning 
is that state. So great learners get into the, into the right state. To learn is to process information. And so we start bringing in information into our minds and we hold it in mind as a movie that we can see and hear and feel. We can step in and be there. So it's information. And then we can take that information and turn it into knowledge. So we, we make conceptual learnings through our knowledge. And this is where we create constructs, beliefs, decisions, understandings. I now understand it. So the difference between knowledge and information is a real basic uh, distinction. We get, our, we get ourselves or our children to memorize things and they have information, but they may not understand it. They may not know it. They may not believe it or have made a decision. So all of the, all of the meta uh, levels occur here at the level of knowledge. When you do that, learning is remembering. And so this information in short-term memory, then long-term memory, it now becomes episodic memory. It becomes narrative memory. It becomes what I, I know and bring to anything I'm going to study. And so the background knowledge. Oftentimes people have learning disabilities and learning problems because of the, of the things that they know that aren't so, but they know it and it's unconscious. Please no. turn off your microphones. Thank you. As we're doing all of this, we are then activating the, the knowledge to get deeper and deeper into ourselves. And as it gets deeper, we're experiencing it. So the state becomes an associated state through experience, which is what we do in NLP. We, we give some information, we explain what it means, we help them to hold it in mind. If they can't, they use their manuals to hold it in mind. And now they go experience it, try it on and feel it. So this is where emotions come in, in learning. Learning is very emotional. Emotions, turn it into neurological patterns. And when you, when you do that kind of learning, that's when you get the dopamine. The, the brain just flushes itself with dopamine as pleasure. And that's when it becomes experiential and we, we know it in our body. So we mind to muscle it to get it into neurology. Um, as we step aside from all of that, we can, we can then look at our program for learning to see how skillful am I, do I bring information in? How well do I visualize, uh, hear, and feel it? How well do I create knowledge from it, hold it in mind? So now we can look at our program to see if it is well-designed or as we learn about our learning to make some new choices and decisions, about our learning. And then finally, learning shows up uh, pragmatically as skills. So what can you do? Your competency. And so we work to become skillful and capable and able to now apply what we've learned so it, it changes the world. It, cha it, it becomes our career. It becomes our contribution, the value that we add. So that gives a more holistic picture of what learning is. And it's gonna speak a lot to those of us who coach, consult, train, parent, uh, or just want to learn ourselves. Michael, I was, I was thinking, uh, what about when we are learning something that is only theory? like theor theoretical uh, uh, information stuff, that we don't really use it as uh, something pragmatic. We don't develop a skill. Uh, 
Yeah. Where does that fit in this model? What, what's happening is we're beginning to use um, this dimension and this dimension, and we're just leaving out experiential state, maybe even background. We're just leaving it out. So a lot of learning disability is a person is not using one of the dimensions. Okay. Okay. And I have another question because I remember that I, I read at least, I don't know, like at least in two or three different books that uh, learning, the best learning state is when we have like alpha brain uh, frequency. And as I know, that means like having a quiet state. It's not very active. What about that? Is this just a myth or? Yeah, that would be one of the myths. In the 50s and 60s, that myth showed up as subliminal learning. You know, you go to sleep at night, you put on a tape recorder <laughs> under your pillow, and in the morning, you'll know all about the Ooh. periodic chemical chart. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we, we now know that that kind of subliminal learning is, is false. Okay. What you can learn subliminally are urges and drives. So you can get a little motivated uh, to be thirsty, to, to want to eat. Uh, so, so subliminally, that can get activated, but you're not going to learn any content or any skills. If we could put someone into an alpha state and then program in, um, we could program in how to be a dentist, how to be a surgeon, how to be a pilot. <laughs> but of course, that's science fiction. Yeah, <laughs> of course. <laughs> Like the movie Inception, no? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. Something else that I was thinking, Michael. I'm, I'm just thinking like the, the classic learning that we know that we have been receiving from so many years. You mentioned the, the learning process when we are at school, when we're just little kids. Um, I, I don't know what do you think about this, but one thing is the, the learning process that is individual, is, is, it is subjective, as you said. But the other piece is how, uh, how they teach us, the teachers, how they teach us. Yeah. So, so uh, I don't know what you think about this, but I remember that, or w one of the things that I have in mind is that when we are in the very beginnings in, in kindergarten, Uh, the kind of learnings that we have, or, or the kind of teaching, uh, better saying, is more experiential. We, we, we sing, we dance, we draw, we do many things. And something that, that I have been observing is that that kind of learnings, they last forever. Even though if the person has Alzheimer, those kind of learnings are like very integrated. But once we go to, to primary school, like basic school, everything turns like very bored. You know, everybody's looking at the teacher, paying attention, being quiet. You know, you don't have to move. You have to be there. So, so the process becomes, I, I think, very different. And that affects what you just said. It, many of the dimensions are out of there. What, do you, what could you say about that? Oh, yeah. So we could spend a whole hour on all the problems of school learning. The first problem is people are not in the right state. And teachers are not trained how to induce state. We do that in trainer's training, how to get engagement, how to do rapport, how to, how to answer the why question. Why should I study this? Yeah. So if you're not in the right state and now you're passive and you're just listening and you're not really creating knowledge, you're just listening, passive listening is deceptive. In, in fact, Here's a big challenge to everybody. What I'm presenting now, uh, you're listening, and it probably makes sense. You, you can passively just entertain it, but, but you're not learning. And the test will be, go, go teach someone, go uh, tell someone everything you heard and learned today. Because when you're active, 
then then you're actually engaged in representing um, and then creating knowledge and then all the rest. So <laughs> passive learning, it, it is so deceptive. You read a book and you think you know it, but try to explain it to someone. <laughs> yeah, that's very different. <laughs> and, and, and especially try to coach it or train it or, or, or consult with it. That information has not been integrated. It's, it's like you, you put it in your mouth, but you didn't chew it up. Yeah. And if you didn't chew it up, you didn't digest it. And if you didn't digest it, it's not inside. Exactly. Exactly. That, that makes sense. Totally. I was thinking in my own experience when, when I learned, learned the first time uh, meta coaching, you know, all the model, and I was trying to, to do coaching, but it's, it was very different. You know, the, the gap between my knowledge intellectually and my skills was yeah. like very far away. And it took me years, really years to integrate it. And now I, I think I can, I can coach. <laughs> I don't know if I do, but <laughs> I think I can coach. So, yeah. Michael, I, we have some questions from, from the audience. Uh, so before, just before we go there, let me say okay. one other thing. Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Here's what happens in school that really messes it up. Kids learn at a meta level. They learn learning is boring. They learn just listen and repeat, just memorize. Um, learning's not for me. Yeah. So they create knowledge about learning and they have metal. And that's now in the background that is the biggest problems for most adults for ongoing learning and, and learning effectively today. Yeah. And they, we need to clean all that out. So those of us who, and those of you who will be teach, will be training accelerated learning or learning genius that we do in NLP, we, we've got to we've got to clean out a lot of those misbeliefs that's interfering and blocking and distorting learning. So meta in this model refers to how we think about our learning. What classifies have we done in our minds about? myself learning about learning in general about reading or whatever and, yeah. and that's wh where we create our belief systems that can prevent us to really learn or can help us if we have the right or the good yeah. beliefs okay wow that makes sense totally okay Sh shall we go for some of the questions Mike? okay so uh somebody i don't know the names but somebody's asking what is the key in order to keep in mind. So that's memory to, to bring it to mind. Uh, there's several keys. If you do not vividly represent something, it's going to be real hard. If, it, if your idea is fuzzy and vague and unclear, so you need to vividly represent it. Um, you need to turn it into knowledge that is meaningful to you. Those were the semantics. I mean, it's got to be meaningful and then to hold it. Our brains are designed to think in narratives. So narrative uh, memory, narrative uh, presentations is the easiest thing to remember. And that's our episodic memory. And so if you can turn it into a story, um, That makes it much, much easier. If, if you, and the story can be a metaphorical story, but it has a beginning, it has a process, it has an end. And the brain grabs that. Now that you're saying that, I remember that I saw a TV program with one of this persons that has like that uh, uh, photographic memory And it was memorizing, I don't know, like 500 names or numbers. I don't know what, what it was. I don't remember. <laughs> I don't remember. But the, the, the structure of uh, or the strategy that he was using was that he was creating in his mind like a pathway, like a story. And there were like stations. And each station was like one of those names or numbers. And that was what you just said. If you can make it a story or something 
more entertainment, it will be easier to, to grab it. Okay, awesome. It's using mnemonics. It, it's, one, it's one mnemonic, a, a great mnemonic, uh, how to remember. Um, a lot of memory also is about state. Because if, if you remember, if you learn something in a certain state and then you get the state back, that will help with memory. Yeah. Okay, awesome. We have one more question. Uh, well, we have a lot. <laughs> what other myths myths do we have or, or are there about learning? I have a whole page on myths. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <clears throat> um, the first one is learning is passive. It's about listening and just following along and that we're blank slates and, or the children are blank slates. That, just completely mythical. Learning is very active. It's, it's stretching, it's questioning, it's exploring, it's experimenting. So the brain has to really be engaged to learn. And what we did last time, and, and I think this is a great takeaway, if you don't have a question that you're trying to answer in your head, if you don't have a question, you're not learning. Mm. Wow. So questions drive learning. Our brains, another aspect of the brain itself is the brain is an answering machine. It needs a question. So never read a book without a question in your mind. Never listen to a presentation without a question in your mind. How can I use this? How can I represent it? What would be a metaphor of it? To some question And of course, the, the, the more, the greater the question, uh, the, the more, the more the learning. Uh, uh, learning is individualistic, is another myth. Um, Viskovsky, uh, Lev Viskovsky, uh, a Russian psychologist, uh, introduced the idea of the zone of uh, proximal development. And he measured two things, what you know now and what you can do on your own and what you could do if you had a uh, informed tutor. And so what you can do now is IQ. What you can do potentially with the assistance of someone else is that zone of, of proximal development. What you're ready to learn, what, what is going to be evolving because you can do it with someone, their guidance, the best learning occurs through guidance. Someone helping to guide us to know what to focus on, what to consider, what to push aside. So the best learning is with others, questioning, interacting, trying to present, uh, challenging it. And so team learning, If we want to turn our, our companies and organizations into great learning organizations, Peter Singe, then we have to learn how to learn together. And so learning is, is uh, individualistic is the myth. Learning is serious is a myth. Learning, learning is designed to be fun and delightful. Your, your brain, Uh, is wired and ready to go with dopamine wow. for those aha moments. Uh, learning is cramming. So here's another thing we learn at school that's really stupid, and that is wait until the last minute and then stay all, up all night and cram for the <laughs> test. And study after study after study has demonstrated that people don't learn and it doesn't stay with them. It goes in, it goes out. And so it's not about, it's not about grasping everything. You can learn more by going slow. I would recommend not speed reading, slow reading. Intentional, slow reading, taking notes, asking questions that that author, of that author, challenging that author on your paper. What about this? So uh, learning is multitasking. No, that's another myth. 
learning is a very focused, um, intense. That's why we do the genius day, so that when you're learning it, that's all you're learning. And and so it's not multitasking. Don't try to read while the TV is going. <laughs> Don't read in bed. Use the bed for something else. <laughs> <laughs> Could be sleeping. <laughs> it would be. <laughs> Here's the worst myth of learning. Mistakes are bad. It means you're stupid. Mm. That's yeah. you. Learning is trial and error, and then feedback, and then updating, correcting in real time the error. Here's another thing about the brain. The brain is an error-detecting machine. We look for errors. And if you try to eliminate all errors, and so good, good learning is making a mistake on purpose to see what happens. Wow. So yeah, there's a lot of myths about learning. Yeah. <laughs> so many. <laughs> I I think the next question uh, may might fit with what we we're talking right now. Uh, it sounds like a metaphor. I think it's a metaphor. It is true that the mind can get full, but needs to be emptied. <laughs> no. no. With the hundred billion neurons that you have in your brain, hundred million a billion, 100 billion neurons, there's something like 17 trillion interconnections. So it'll never be filled. Never. Now, <laughs> now, you, you may, you, here's the thing about study. If you're really learning, it's going to be very intense and you ought to take a break every 90 minutes, at least. Because there can be brain strain as you're focusing and learning and you need to give it a break and let it, let incubation occur. Incubation is a process of letting it uh, loose so that the unconscious parts of the mind can work on it. Um, but um, you, you'll never get filled. And the thing, the, one of the things about the meta learning is the more you learn, the more your capacity for learning increases So your capacity for learning increases. And what you know is what you don't know. Mm. And now we're getting to the edge where wisdom starts. Wisdom is knowing that I don't know. Okay. Wow. And there's so much more. We have one question about wisdom. How do we effectively develop wisdom from learning? Well, if learning is complex, wisdom is... 10 times. Even more. <laughs> more. That's the book I'm working on now um, and working on a model on, on wisdom. Um, wisdom uh, has, has two completely different aspects. One is the theoretical so that I know things that are timeless truths, that, that are true every place, every person, every culture, timeless truths. That's what Aristotle, Socrates, Plato, that, that's what they were going after. Then there's the wisdom, the practical wisdom of how to live life. So the, the book of Proverbs in the Bible uh, starts off in Proverbs 1 saying, Solomon has written these things so that you know how to live and, and, and live and thrive. So how to live life. So we've got the two extremes of wisdom. Wisdom is different from every other form of knowledge. There's no content. And so it, it, it appears at a moment, at an instance, in a context of uncertainty and ambiguity. And in that context, at that moment, for that person, it was, the, it was a wise, insightful understanding decision. But if you take that and say, that's the content of wisdom, so learn that, it's not going to apply to other people, other times, other contexts. So wisdom um, is a momentary flare-up um, awareness of just the right thing in the right moment, the right way. And, and so it's a very different state from learning. Okay. 
Michael, I'm, I'm going to leave uh, for a while the questions uh, because I think it's uh, it's a good time to, uh, I don't know, how, how are you going to do this, but what about having like a practical way of using the seven dimensions of learning? And I was thinking, what about learning, for, for example, the meta model? How could we use the seven dimensions for using the meta model? The meta model? So I'm going to learn the NLP meta model of 12 or 21 distinctions, linguistic yeah. distinctions. So the first question I would have for myself is what state do I need to be in? What would be the best state? Curious, uh, interested, motivated, um, relaxed yet excited um, for learning the meta model. So what would be the state? How can I get myself into that state? It's about language. So now at the meta learning level, the, the intention, why do I want to learn the meta model? Well, this will give me precision and specificity in communication. So I have a, a big reason why I want to learn it. Um, then I can be more precise in my communications. I can flush out uh, nonsense or vagueness. Um, being in that state, then I want to represent it. So the meta model is going to be uh, a series of, of linguistic distinctions with questions. So how I represent in my mind is I've got a linguistic distinction, universal quantifier, which under that means everyone, all, none, nobody. So universal quantifiers. And then my question is, Everybody, nobody, always. And so what I'm going to represent will be that series of distinctions, questions. And so distinctions, questions, I always like putting it as two side. Here's my distinction. Here's my question. Okay. So when I learn it, I'm going to learn distinction, question, distinction, que question, distinction. So I'll, I'll represent it in that way. The concepts and the knowledge it would be things like my understanding of what the meta model is and what it can do as a linguistic distinction for coaching, consulting, training. Uh, I might create some beliefs. This will give me power over language and let me let language do service to me rather than me being a victim of the language that occurs. So I'm going to build up some concepts about the meta model. As I do this, um, and especially as I have ways of remembering, remembering in short-term memory, I will space out my learnings. So day one, I might learn three distinctions, um, deletions, universal quantifiers, nominalizations. The next day, I'll, I'll learn three more. Next day, I'll learn three. So I'll space out my learnings. Spacing out learnings is a meta-learning understanding of how best learnings work. Uh, as I space it out, I'll also um, find a way to speak about it um, to as many people as I can during the day. Because that which is expressed is impressed. There was a quotation from Aristotle, that which is expressed is impressed. So expressing what you know, talking about it. Every time my daughter comes home uh, and we're reading at the coffee shop or wherever, I'm always at, what, what's she going to learn? Because I want her to express it. Because I know if she expresses it, it's going to be more deeply impressed. Um, then uh, experientially, I, I want to see if I can experience the meta model. Uh, Nominalization um, comes to mind right now. <laughs> Nominalization. So the distinction is a verb turned into a noun. So here's this, here's this moving thing that's been frozen. Here's this moving active verb process that's been turned into a static. Now, so 
Um, let me see if I can experience that. I'll be the verb. Relating. I'll get down on the floor and walk around relating. Then I'll stand up. Relationship. I'll get down on the floor. Movement. Moment. And then I'll stand up. Motivation. So I can learn how to experience the words, not just know them academically. So that would be experiential. Uh, years ago in, in Australia, I taught the meta model in that way. Um, so every time we learned a distinction, we turned it into an experience. <laughs> and then from experience into pragmatic. Uh, so uh, grab a newspaper, let's read a line from the editorial or the, or the news reporting and any deletions, any um, lost performatives, who says that? Any nominalizations, any cause effect, any uh, presumption, presuppositions. And so now pragmatically being able to use the meta model. Wow, <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> wow, so that, that's a whole strategy, Michael. Uh, and I think many times we do it by, you, you know, like unconscious, but at least in NLP, we learn to do that and, and in neurosemantics. But having the, like the pathway and the steps and how we do different things, it, it makes it totally different. It's more, more conscious. Uh, and so one of the things that called my attention is that in many of the, of the seven dimensions, what we are doing really is asking questions to ourselves. Yeah. So what's the right step? The, the right state? Uh, what, what is my intention? Uh, how can I represent this in my mind? How so? So many, many. Perhaps every every uh, dimension could be by asking some questions, like coaching ourselves. Exactly. Yeah. Wow. Awesome. Yeah. Okay. Let me go back to some of the questions that we have. Uh, somebody is asking, is dyslexia a defect in receiving knowledge or re uh, retaining, retaining the knowledge in the background? How do we treat, treat it? Does dyslexia, uh, occur? the problem occurs at the representation level because they're turning letters around, they're turning words around, dyslexia. So it, it's, it's a problem with representation. And there are some studies now that indicate that people who have dyslexia, there's, there's some misfiring going on uh, among the neurons that, um, uh, that causes that. Of course, if it isn't dealt with quickly, then the child will, will come up with, um, I can't learn, I'm stupid, I don't get it. And, and then that stuff becomes part of their meta learning, which then creates more problems here because it, it creates stress. The worst state for learning is stress. It's just absolutely the worst state. If you're anxious, performance anxiety. If you're anxious and, and uh, concerned about the pressure to learn, it's the worst state. And that happens oftentimes with people with dyslexia. So uh, helping them to slow down and to, and to look, is that a B or a D? Is the line on this side or that side? And, and then making distinctions. So at this level, we make distinctions and distinctions is the heart of genius. Distinctions is the distinction that makes the difference. And, and so dyslexia would occur first here. And then, and then because of the dimensions, it goes everywhere else. Michael, I have, I have a like a, uh, about, I have a question because when, when you were presenting, like, how can we use uh, the seven dimensions for learning meta the meta model? Uh, you said the first thing is to like create the state, the right state. We, we, we start there, like what's the right state? But what about if we have, or the person has, some toxic beliefs about learning or about himself. Is it going to be possible to get into right state or to keep it or maintain it in the meantime? Or, 
or perhaps the first step is another one. Okay, so that's really a great question because it asks, where do we start? Because if the person's learnings, meta learnings is the background and puts them in that state and they're in the wrong state, the best thing for learning is to jar them out of that state. This is where uh, state interruptions, pattern interruptions, and other things that can shock a person so that where what they're oriented for doesn't work. If a person is oriented for, um, I'm not going to learn, and that's their orientation, um, the best thing is shock them out of that whole state. Um, and uh, so, so that would be when there's that kind of a learning disability based on a belief. Okay. So the next question, I think it's uh, more about the, the same. Uh, what is the best way to clean out the misbeliefs at the meta level? Yeah. Uh, I would say the meta, yes, meta, no, but what else would you, would you say? Well, this is where the best learning is collective, is collaborative learning. That's the highest quality learning. And that's why coaching is adult learning in real time and is such a powerful methodology. So the best way to clean that out, get with someone and who can ask you those questions. So what conclusion did you draw when that happened? And because, and when they repeat it as an acknowledgement. So you believe that you, that you cannot believe, learn. It always sounds different when it comes from someone else's voice. Yeah. It sounds logical here, but when it comes from someone else's voice, it doesn't sound so logical. And, and so collective learning, and this is where good tutoring or good coaching really comes in to, to, to um, enhance and refresh a person's learning methodologies. Okay. 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 Let me see what, what else do we have? We have some more questions. Um, where does genetics play in part of in learning and can genetics be changed with learning? Well, in humans, genetics plays a very small part. Um, we don't understand why animals, all their learning, just almost all of their learning except some associative learning, uh, connecting something to an emotion, associative learning uh, with an animal, it's all programmed. And with us, almost nothing is programmed. So um, we don't, we, in the neurosciences, we just cannot explain uh, this openness for learning. Now, if a person does have brain damage or lesions in the brain, um, if there is a physical, that would be a physiology, not genetics, um, then, then that would be a whole nother problem and something to be dealt with at that level, the level of medicine. Um, but but that's, a, that's like less than 1% of the population. So that's really the exception to the rule. Uh, the rule is we can all learn. And you just think about all the languages on planet Earth, the 170 languages. A baby can be born and within, within three years can be fluent in any language. And if there's two languages in the house, they can be fluent in two languages. Somehow they distinguish this is French and this is English, or this is Chinese and Spanish. So, we're born ferocious learners, and uh, that, that's the genetics. So we could say that DNA has nothing to do with some persons that have difficulties for learning. No. It, it will be more like physiological damages or something like that. Okay, okay. Um, somebody else has, is asking, can the brain subconsciously make mistakes in order to the brain to learn? 
I don't fully understand the question. Can the brain subconsciously make mistakes in order to the brain to learn for the for the brain to learn? It's not, it's not very clear. Well, we, we we do make mistakes. I mean, that's that's just part of our fallibility. Where we're always drawing false conclusions, especially during childhood. We overgeneralize. We personalize. We awfulize. We do all those cognitive distortions. So we make mistakes. They need to be, and and this is where learning needs to be continual, so that we keep updating, uh, getting the update. <laughs> for whatever the information is, um, because it's a fallible brain. And we do make mistakes. Um, and then we learn those mistakes. And if you lock it in, if you lock it in, it, it, you'll take those mistakes with you everywhere you go. Okay. What is the role of IQ in learning? IQ, um, the people who have measured it and Many of the people who have measured it have given up that measurement. Robert Sternberg is an example. And he, he was one of the research psychologists who was developing different intelligent tests. Eventually, he wrote a book, Practical Intelligence. And he and Howard Gardner, Gardner now has nine multiple intelligences. And so there's nine different kinds of tests for the nine different kinds of intelligences. So there is no such thing as a general IQ. Um, it is a statistical average uh, and it's based upon children in, in uh, elementary, middle, and high schools where they should be at a certain age. That's what it's based on. Um, but IQ is about your understanding of something. So it would be representation and knowledge, your ability to abstract to philosophical premises and presuppositions. Uh, EQ is the ability to, to take your knowledge and your emotions and integrate them so that you can manage yourself. And that would be part of mental learning, EQ. SQ, significance um, uh, or spiritual uh, into, quotient, is the meaningfulness of it. So uh, have you set a, <clears throat> uh, an intention that your learning is going to be meaningful? If you wanna kill learning, learn something that is uh, irrelevant. <laughs> Just go pick up some book that you have no interest in and start reading. And you can really put cold water all over your passions for learning. So, uh, having an intention to where I see the meaning of it, the significance of it. So what you said, what you just said, means that for learning we need to have like a, like a, a, a strong intention to learn. If we don't, then it is it's not going to make sense. It's not going to yeah. fit. So all teachers need to be retrained and retaught as teachers that you don't start your lesson until you got them intentional, motivated. Because otherwise, if their intention is not to learn, they can defeat the, the greatest teacher. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, somebody else is asking, how important is on learning in the process of learning? Yeah. So I got a whole chapter on unlearning in the, a new book on executive learning, and it's, it's critically important. So the ability to unlearn, you have to recognize I've got a wrong learning. It's not, it's not right, it's not productive, it's not effective. So run the ecology questions. Once you know what it is, sometimes just that awareness uh, is strong enough, but, but you usually have to replace it with what is a useful learning. So I'll unlearn this and I'll learn this. I'll unlearn that criticism hurts my feelings. And I'll learn criticism is an opportunity to show my skills in handling language. So I've got to replace it with something better than the old learning. 
And along that way, I need to have some good motivation, some good intentions. Why change this? Then um, I might need to make things go away. So that'd be another step. I need to make these representations go away. And we've got lots of tools to do that, uh, especially metaphorical tools. In the book, Thinking Metaphorically, I've got a whole chapter on negation, how to make things go away, get them out of your mind um, with different metaphors. Okay. So unlearning um, uh, is such an important skill because most of us uh, intentionally or unintentionally, consciously or unconsciously have picked up learnings that don't, don't serve us. Well. Michael, listening to uh, what you just said, I, one of the things that I, I'm just thinking, uh, and I'm going to turn it into a question, is uh, w if, we, if we need to unlearn some things in order to really learn, perhaps one of the things we need to unlearn is like the wrong strategy for learning. Because sometimes we create like a strategy And it doesn't work, but anyway, we keep that strategy once and again and again and again. Yeah. So, so that will be one of the things, I, I guess, besides, right. of course, the wrong beliefs and whatever is at the meta level. Right. <laughs> I tell the story in the book, Executive Learning, about a medical doctor that I met here in Colorado years ago. He was an orthopedic surgeon. So whenever he looked at someone's knee, he would look at He, they would take the x-rays. He would look at it. He'd get a second opinion. Sometimes he'd get a third opinion. He'd look at it again. He went through this long, elaborate decision-making, due diligence process to figure out his surgery required. He retired. I met him two years after he had retired. He, um, uh, he was alone, uh, didn't have a, uh, a wife. And he came into the counseling office And with the complaint, um, the male is killing me. <laughs> I, said, I said, you're talking about U.S. postal letters and mail. <laughs> and he said, and magazines and flyers. And, and, and I said, well, how is it killing you? He said, well, I get the mail and I put it on my dining room table. Now I've got a whole stack of first class mail, second class mail, third class mail, flyers, magazines. <laughs> and, and I said, I guess someone has told you, just open it. And he said, it doesn't work that way. <laughs> it turned out he was using his old strategy of decision making. And, and so, so I, had, I had him go into the experience of deciding to do orthopedic surgery. So he went through the whole process. At the very end, I, uh, he got to the place where he said, this needs to be done. It has to be done. We're going to do it. And when he got to that state of decisiveness, I anchored it. Okay. <laughs> In those days, I did kinesthetic anchors. <laughs> <laughs> I anchored it. And then um, he said, so we got that anchor, tested it. And then I said, oh, by the way, you're male. <laughs> <laughs> To streamline yeah. that C open. <laughs> <laughs> Did it work? <laughs> yeah. It he was amazed. Awesome. He came back and he said, that was just, ma that was magic. <laughs> <laughs> right, so oh. we call it anchoring. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. <laughs> okay. Uh, let me see what else do we have. Um, what is the role of repetition in learning? Well, repetition is, is critical. Um, we say repetition is the mother of all learning. But the repetition has to be meaningful and conscious. If you're just doing it rote memory, it's going to take a long time. Um, I, still, I still memorize things from time to time. Uh, little statements I'm going to make at a speech, I'll memorize it. And the repetition, spaced uh, practice, go over it, a day later, go over it, day late, see how far I can get without looking at it. And so repetition 
uh, neurologically, uh, 20, 30 days of repeating anything, and it's going to get in. And so repetition is is an important piece. When, when I read and study on a daily basis, when I pull out the book to get ready, I always orient myself. What do I know? What am I looking for? How is this going to be the next piece of whatever I'm working on? I orient myself and remember, um, sometimes if I don't, I'll go I'll, I'll look at the notes or the papers that I've written so that I'm starting as much as possible from where I ended. Okay, so uh, part of what I'm listening, Michael, is that repetition needs to be significant in order to really uh, be integrated. And also, I don't know, well, you didn't mention it, but I, I, what I'm listening is that needs to be experiential. So it's not only repeating by repeating, it's not only wording, it's also involving your emotions. Is that right? Right. Okay. Okay. Yeah, the more experiential we can make it, then the, the stronger the memory. All of this works systemically. So even though I went through it, one, two, three, three, it all is systemic and interacts with each other. Okay. We have one, uh, two more questions. Uh, how can we use our gastronomical senses for learning effectively? Does eating chocolates and nuts by reading help in learning? <laughs> well, the, the uh, gustatory and olfactory senses uh, help us to learn those subjects, eating um, and fixing meals and doing things like that. So it's, I, I've not seen any research that eating chocolate is going to help. <laughs> if, if you eat a little bit of chocolate and it puts you into a nice, pleasant state <laughs> and, and you're easier to live with. Okay. <laughs> you know, okay. <laughs> But It, it, it does nothing other than just helps you with your state. Okay. <laughs> I don't oh. think it's going to lubricate your neurons. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's just going to put you in a good state, a ple pleasure state. Okay. Uh, someone else is asking, is that is that's why the first of format in NSTT is why to tr trigger interest and intention? Yeah. Okay. Okay. And we have a last question. Uh, this was before. Uh, what do you think about Roger's shank phrase? Learning occurs when someone wants to learn, not when someone wants to teach. Yeah. Oh, that, yeah, that's a nice proverb about how teach how learning is so is an active intentional process. Okay. So, Michael, uh, we are, I think, in time to, to say, uh, to close the, the webinar. Anything else that you want to add in this uh, presentation? Well, we're learners. In neural semantics, uh, we're learners. Um, neurology, semantics, to learn the best meanings, the highest meanings, into the best practices. That's what we're all about. So when we, when we practice neural semantics um, and do it with other people, coaching, training, consulting, we are facilitating people to learn. Because if they can't learn, can't keep it, can't remember it, can't use it, then, then our work is going to be quite ineffective and we won't keep getting work. When we can help people And this is the reason I started into looking at the structure of learning. When we become great facilitators of learning through the questions, through, through recognizing where they're weak and what needs to be strengthened or where the learning disability, and most of the time it's, it's a disability in one of the dimensions. So it's limiting beliefs, limiting decisions, <laughs> limiting identities. When you can recognize where it is and you go right there and you facilitate them making changes there, 
it's going to accelerate their whole learning um, capacity and enjoyment. And if we could turn people on to learning, if we could be a great model ourselves, always learning and, and of discovering new things every day, and, and we can help individuals learn, groups learn, learn how to learn with each other in the group, because that's a real weakness in group coaching. People are not learning from each other. They could, but they hide information and they play politics. If they could learn, if, if the people in the higher management levels could learn how to learn and keep learning, but um, too many don't. Uh, probably the majority do not, and they're not passionate about learning because um, learning implies change. And so as change agents, learning agents, um, inspiring people uh, to get into a habit of, of really learning and expressing their learning. If we could do that, we could make really a tremendous impact on the cultures that we live in, the families we live in, the world we live in. So it's not just another subject. It is the subject. It is the fundamental human resource to think and to learn and, and, and hopefully to do so in a wise way. Michael, I have one, one more question. Uh, when, are we, when are you going to do this as a training? And my thought is perhaps to fit it in every other training that we do in neurosemantics as the first part. So if, we, if we're going to learn NLP, first to have like this, you know, this uh, short uh, training for how to learn it. Yeah. If we're going to do APG or whatever training, I would say this, this should be like, a, a, I don't know how to say like a, a previous part of any training that we do in neurosemantics. Anything that you want to say about that? Well, I think you're absolutely right because if you go into a, a, a group especially an in-service group inside an organization, and they have to be there, yeah. <laughs> you, you can guarantee they're not in the right state exactly. to learn. And if they want to get their money's worth, it would probably be worth two hours, three hours of just introducing this. Exactly. Um, and, and then whatever you're teaching, uh, they'll get more out of it. And, and the enjoyment. It's the enjoyment that will really sell this when people learn how to really have fun learning. Awesome. Awesome. I'll be waiting. <laughs> yeah. Whenever, the, whenever we can get out from this prison of the house that's locked down, we'll uh, out into the world. And sure. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael. Thank you, Geraldine. <laughs> It was great to, to have this webinar. I, I really enjoy it and I learn a lot. So Kobati, I'll go back to you. Wow, yes. Thank you, David. Thank you, uh, Michael. I certainly am on dopamine overdrive. <laughs> <laughs> Having listened to all of that, it's, I've just been going, wow. Questions drive learning. The best learning is collaborative. That which is expressed, is impressed. I, I really took a whole lot out of that. And so for us, I think colleagues around the room, the best thing it says to me is we go out there and start to, and talk about what we learned today so that that can be impressed. It was really a lovely session. Thank you, Michael, for sharing your brilliance with us. Uh, I certainly never, ever take this for granted. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay, so guys, before we go, we, you know that we're going to take a picture. That's what we always do. We've got to put our best smiles, put your video on so that, um, what's his name? Tarek Mohammed can take a picture. And Mohammed also has an announcement for us. So after the picture, please do not go away. Stay so that we can uh, hear the announcement and uh, yeah, before you go. Michael, uh, Mohammed, are you ready? I am. 
So yeah. I would like to ask okay. you to just turn on your cameras and, and please don't send any messages while we're taking the pictures. Okay, okay. so ready? <laughs> please yeah. put a big smile on your face. And please don't send messages. Please don't send messages. Stop chatting. Okay, perfect. Put a big smile on your face and let's take the picture. Please don't send messages. Those who are sending messages, please don't write on the chat box. <laughs> oh, people. Maybe they're please turned on. listen. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's let's do that again. Put a big smile on your face. Okay. Well. Another picture, put a big smile on your face. <laughs> Keep smiling, we're almost there. <laughs> it hurts. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, I was about to say that. <laughs> and the last picture. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. <laughs> We are done. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Yeah. You've had us exercise our facial muscles. <laughs> yeah. <as well. laughs> That's right. Thank you. Okay. So the All announcement right. I have Thank before you. we end our meeting today is it's about the NSCT. We are finally ready to start having people join the NSCT, and we will be sending more details about that. And the good news is it will be in Egypt uh, next February. The good news is we have like easy payment plans up up to a one year after the training. So that should make it much easier for those who are interested to join the training. And if you are already a trainer and you want to like bring your students, please get in touch with me uh, because we do have a referral program and we'd like to work with you to have the best NSCT this next year. So thank you and please get with, in touch with me if you have any questions about that. Mohammed, and and perhaps uh, also with the institute directors directly, so that that will be another pathway to to get into the uh, NSTT and have a sure. Yeah. Okay, you can repeat the date, uh, says Mohammed. Yes. So the date of the NSTT, it will be from the twelves. Let me double check my calendar here. Yes, it will be from the 12th of February till the 26th of February. Okay, awesome. and we, we did get a very good hotel in a very good location in Sharm el Sheikh in Egypt. So we're looking forward to have you with us next year. Very excited. Yes, very excited to be here. <laughs> Thank yes. you. I'll be there. Okay. <laughs> okay. Bye. Thank you, Mariani. Have we covered everything? Yes, yes, we are all oh, we have. done. Yeah, <laughs> you we have older, but everything. it's still okay. Yeah, say and that now again. You can go to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> go to sleep. We are earlier, but it's okay. It's yeah, I the moderator uh -oh. felt. I guess maybe the, all the questions were answered, right, David? Uh, yes. No extra questions. Yeah. No extra questions. All just to learn about learning. Wow. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right. Thank you, guys. Um, Thank, Thank you, you, Michael. Go, Thank you, everybody. Go and express so that we can impress. Says Muhammad, we need to be vaccinated to, to be uh, in Cairo. Okay, we are all speaking. No, no, you, you don't need to be vaccinated to, to come to Egypt. You just need to have the PCR test. And in Sharm el Sheikh, where, where we'll be having the event, you can actually have that on arrival. Because it's a touristic city and it's it's actually very safe there, and the test is really easy to do there uh, once you arrive if you don't have it ready before you come. Cool. Cool. Look forward to it. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good evening. Good day. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye